Good evening to everybody. Appreciate all of you being here on a hot Wednesday evening. Uh, but uh, it's going to be 1st of July tomorrow, and it's time for heat, isn't it? I guess, if we're going to have it. Appreciate you coming out tonight, and uh, hope that your week has been good thus far and will continue to be good as we uh, go through the rest of it, the Lord willing. And I uh, want to go to the Lord in prayer to lead us off, and then we'll get right into our our lesson and uh, uh, deal with what uh, we have here to look at this evening. Father, we thank you for the wonderful blessings that you bestow upon us always. This week, no exception to that. You've been gracious and wonderful in how you have provided. We give you praise and honor and glory for all that you have done and all that you are doing. Thank you for the uh, portion of health and strength that we are blessed with. And through that, we were able to come this way and be here tonight. We thank you for each one who has come this way. We pray that you will bless each person, warm their hearts, uplift their spirits, and challenge us as well as we look at the lesson here this evening. We pray for the request of prayer. There are many, many needs. We ask that you provide for each one. As we have listened to newscasts, we're reminded of challenges in our nation, uh, issues that have brought about a lot of grief, uh, things that have happened that's brought about a lot of grief in the lives of family members in our land. I pray for them tonight. I ask, Lord, that you provide as no one else can provide for meeting the need that each one has. Open again, we pray our hearts to the, your precious word this evening and uh, may the Holy Spirit lead us in the things that we seek to share. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in just a moment, we'll be in the fourth chapter of Proverbs for a couple of verses of scripture, <clears throat> we'll be looking elsewhere uh, in the Bible as well in our time of study here tonight. If you haven't gotten an outline yet, there's more here on the table at the uh, front, so be sure and get one. If we run out, let me know and we'll try to catch up. I'm taking a list. Uh, you know, for those that we need to catch up on. Tonight, we're going to talk about avoiding drifting. Avoid drifting is the title of our lesson. Over the past two weeks, and tonight makes three, of course, we've talked about some of the things that we need to avoid as we live each and every day for our Savior. And I've said, I think almost every Wednesday night, that I feel like I'm uh, preaching to the choir, teaching the choir. These are things that we know and we understand, but it's good for us to be reminded of them, I think. We, in our first lesson, looked at avoiding complacency. Last week in our lesson, we looked at avoiding deception. So tonight, we're going to look at avoid drifting, avoid drifting. The word drift is not a word that you will find in the King James Version of the Bible. It's not there. Uh, unless unless you have a commentary that says otherwise. <laughs> uh, but you will not find the word in in your Bible, but I will tell you that it is implied in many, many different passages that we can read. It has, as far as the word is concerned, several meanings when you pick up the dictionary and look at what, what that word means. There's a number of things that are listed under the word drift or drifting. 
But as I'm using it here tonight, it means to go along without knowing or caring where one is going. To go along without knowing or caring where one is going. Have you ever heard the expression, or maybe the, the question would be, have you ever made the statement, uh, some people just drift through life. They just go along just like they're not caring at all about where they're going and very lackadaisical about what's taking place in life and so forth. The reason that my attention is drawn to this is because that I believe that believers can be caught up in the tendency to go along living their lives each and every day without giving thought to where they are going. And in actuality, what is taking place in their lives is they are drifting away from God. Remember I said, I believe believers can go along and not think about where they're going. Sometimes they do. Sometimes it's a very conscious thing, but not always. And sometimes the direction that they go in moves them away from God. They get further and further away from God, and therefore they get colder and colder in their relationship with God. And I certainly don't want that to happen in my life, and I'm sure you join with me in saying you don't want that to happen in your life either. We just don't want that to happen in our life. Let's look at what Solomon says in chapter 4, and let's look at two verses, be verse 14 and 15 of Proverbs chapter 4. He says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. There's our word. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. And pass away. Now, in these verses, Solomon is warning his sons not to drift into the path of wicked and evil men. He recognizes that there is such a path, and he does not want his sons to go down that particular path. And the heading of this uh, particular chapter in the Schofield Reference Bible is to sons. It's addressed to sons. I assume that to be his sons or maybe others in the kingdom that were growing up under his influence and so forth. Maybe not necessarily blood kin to him, but he considered them his sons. And so he is giving his warnings out to them and telling them to be careful how they travel. Don't go through life just drifting. Don't go through life not knowing or caring where you're going. That'll lead you down the wrong road, take you down the wrong path. Make sure you know where you're going. Avoid doing the former. Going down a road, caring not for what is taking place. Though he said these words, I think it's interesting whenever we think about the fact that in his later years, Solomon himself was guilty of drifting away from God. Uh, the wisest man in the, uh, uh, in the earth... The wisest man at that particular time, because God had endowed him with tremendous wisdom, he knew what path he needed to travel on, and yet, as he lived his life and got further along in his life, he began to drift. If, if that could happen to Solomon, don't you suppose it can happen to us as well? I think so. I agree with you, and I see heads shaking. I agree with you. There are 
uh, any number of other biblical characters that we can talk about who also drifted. Uh, while that word is not used, like I said earlier, it is certainly implied whenever we look at uh, certain men of the Bible, like, for example, Noah. Noah drifted after the flood. Um, Sad, sad commentary there in the scripture regarding that. Um, David drifted. We know how he drifted. A man after God's own heart. We've talked about him of late on more than one occasion. Lot was a man that the Bible says was a righteous man, but he vexed his soul with the, the uh, evil activities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So he drifted. Um, Jonah drifted. And the list goes on. Come to the New Testament. You think about uh, probably any number of people, but the one that came to my mind as I was preparing for this was Paul uh, talking about in his letter to Timothy, in his second letter to Timothy, he said, one of his uh, cohorts by the name of Demas had forsaken him. That means apparently implied there that Demas drifted away from what Paul was adhering to and holding on to, preaching and teaching and proclaiming with such great power and having tremendous influence. Uh, yet apparently he drifted. So there are a number of examples given in the scripture of those who have drifted. A number of things influence a person's tendency to drift. Um, if they are influencers then that bring about drifting, then we need to identify them. We need to know what they are and strive to avoid them, right? Thus, the title of our lesson, Avoid Drifting. Know what the influencers are that cause drifting and then avoid those influencers as we live our lives each and every day for the Lord. Now, obviously, I will not be able to give us a full list. I wouldn't even try to give us a a, a full list of all the things that are influencers that can cause us to drift. But I do want to give us three tonight, and you can add to this list. You can take the notes home with you, and you can just keep on adding as the, the Lord touches your heart, the Holy Spirit opens your heart, and you think about uh, things that you know from God's precious word. But let's consider these three things that I want to share with you tonight. Number one, we must avoid carnality. We must avoid carnality. Now, what in the world is carnality? Well, when you look at 1 Corinthians, and you'll remember this passage of Scripture, chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians Paul used the word carnal to speak of the old Adamic nature, which some believers that he was really wanting to challenge and transform their understanding and their way of thinking as he wrote this letter, he spoke of them as being carnal. Now, I don't know what your opinion might be, um, and if we disagree on this point, uh, you know my favorite expression, let's agree to disagree and still love one another. I use it a lot, and you're seeing that. <clears throat> but I heard a preacher one time on the radio, and I've never forgotten it. He, he made this statement almost verbatim. This, these may not be his precise words, but it's very close to what I remember him saying. He said, there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. 
no such thing as a carnal Christian. Well, I take issue with that. I really do. I take issue with that because apparently in the church at Corinth, there were believers there, but they were carnal in nature because Paul said they were. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3, if you're following along, and you can read these scriptures later. But he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. These individuals had not grown sufficiently in uh, their experience with Christ. They had not grown uh, significantly, we might say, in what was available to them with regard to the teachings of uh, spiritual things at that particular time. And Paul says to the, of them, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. I couldn't speak to you like a mature believer. I had to speak to you like a babe in Christ because you were still carnal in many of the ways that you think and, and much of what you do exemplifies a carnal approach to what you do. And here's what he says in verse 3. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Indicative of the fact that there had not been uh, as much growth, spiritually speaking, as Paul would have liked to have seen in that congregation of believers. And so he said, rather than speak to you with those things that are if you will, strong meat from the word of God, I'm having to speak to you like I would speak to a little babe. You've not grown. And as a result of not growing, there's things that are going on in your midst that ought not to be taking place. You see, carnality, which I think is a real thing, in the life of uh, many believers, carnality is an influence which will prevent spiritual growth. It will cause envying and strife and divisions over time unless that spiritual, uh, that lack of spiritual growth is corrected with more intense study of God's word and more development in the things of God that enable one to be strong in the Lord. A person who is experiencing carnality in their life is also a person who is not experiencing the real joy of salvation. And the Lord wishes for us to really experience tremendous joy in him, in knowing him as our personal savior. So carnality, to me, is an evil influence, and it is an influence that we need to strive to avoid as we live our lives for the Lord. We don't, we don't want to be as little babes in Christ, we want to be strong, mature, adult believers in the Lord and continuing to partake of the wonderful, wonderful table that is spread with many, many wonderful things for us to know and understand from God's precious and holy word. We don't want to go down the road of being a carnal believer, one who has not grown and one who is going their way but not really caring about and being concerned about where it is that they are going. 
The second one that I offer you tonight is one that comes to us from 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. But you're not going to find the word avoid here. What you're going to find is the word eschew. E-S-C-H-E-W. And here's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 8. He said, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are hereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, now watch these words, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil, there's the word. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Now, Paul used, or excuse me, Peter used the word eschew in this passage, and it is the only time that it is recorded in the King James Version of the Bible. It's the only time. Right here it is. The word eschewed or eschewed is used an additional three times all in relationship to talking about Job. Job chapter 1, verse 1, talks about uh, Job being a man that eschewed evil. And then down in verse 8 of chapter 1, the word eschewed is used. And then in chapter 2, verse 3, the word eschewed is used as God communicates with Satan about this man Job and talks about him being a man that excheweth evil. The word by definition means, guess what? To avoid. It means to avoid. So the word avoid is not used here by Peter, but the word he did use means the same thing. Here's something that needs to be avoided or something that needs to be shunned. Now, Paul used a different word. He didn't use the word, of course, eschew. He didn't use the word avoid. But he used the word abstain. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, he said these very simple words. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Avoid it. Don't have anything to do with it. Avoid all appearance of evil. So, with regard to point number two then, the word eschew, the word abstain, and the word avoid all line up, suggesting unto us that we must avoid evil. So then the question becomes, what do we mean when we talk about evil? Well, I think we all know and understand what evil is. It's those things which are bad, those things that are not appropriate and should not be a part of our life. But let me add to that, that from the dictionary, uh, the point of view that is given in Webster's thesaurus for students that I use regularly in my studying. It's a great resource. But it says that the word evil speaks of whatever is harmful or disastrous to morals or well-being. Whatever is harmful to morals or well-being, those things we need to avoid. Therefore, I would say unto us that there's many, many things that can fall under that heading. And we could just keep listing things that would fall under the heading of those things that 
would be considered to be harmful or disastrous to morals and well-being and good life, good living, so to speak. Um, but I've listed a few things on, on the outline for you to think about and to meditate upon. Like, for example, uh, the unhealthy opinions and the teachings of carnal thinkers. Uh, people that don't have their thought processes influenced by the right resources that should be influencing them. And therefore, they submit their thoughts and their opinions. And if we are not careful, we can be caught up into accepting them and believing them. We have preachers that do that all the time. Um, we, have, we have preachers around the world here in this country who are espousing their opinions and their thoughts and so forth. And unfortunately, many are being deceived. That's evil. In the eyes of God, that is an evil thing to occur. And we need to be careful that we avoid that. So we need to watch and be careful, as I've said already before, what we see, what we hear, and what we do. A second thing that can be evil for us that we need to avoid is being caught up in this thing of tradition that has been passed on from ages past. So many people are caught up in the throes of tradition these days. Now, there are things that are very important to me that or that have been passed on from my forefathers as traditions to me. And there are things that are very important to me that are traditions for us in this great nation. And one of them is coming up this weekend, by the way. The tradition of celebrating the 4th of July and Independence Day in our great nation. I'm proud to be an American and thankful that I live in the United States of America and that I've had the privilege to serve under the stars and stripes and uh, that's very, very special to me. But there are a lot of traditions that have been passed down that are really no good whatsoever. And if we're not careful, we can get caught up in the throes of those things and think that that's the way it has always been, so that's the way it's got to always be. And it can be very harmful. It can even be evil. It can cause us to, to be captivated by some evil things if we are not careful. Secret sins. We think we have them covered up. But God knows. He knows all things, doesn't he? But secret sins can be something that can be disastrous in our lives. If we want to avoid evil, then we must avoid having secret sins in our lives. And that means that if we realize that there is sin in our lives, then we are to confess it to the Lord and seek his forgiveness just like 1 John 1, 9 tells us that we're supposed to do. Another evil is <clears throat> that of having a critical spirit. That's something I don't want to be a part of my life. I, I just, I do not want to have a critical spirit. I want to do everything in my power to avoid having a critical spirit because I see the evil in that. I'm sure you agree with me on that, but in all likelihood, every one of us have known or know someone that we recognized as being a person with a critical spirit. Nothing was right. Everything was wrong. No matter what went on, everything was wrong. Uh, 
Brother Julius may have heard this story. You may have heard this story. I don't know if I can articulate it correctly, but it's one, it's one of them traditional things that's been passed on down through the years, and preacher after preacher has kind of picked it up, and it goes something like this, that there was a church on one occasion that had a, a gentleman in that church who was quite an influencer, but he had a critical spirit and he was always against everything that came up. In the business meeting or whatever, he just was critical of everything and he was opposed to it. And so in one of the business meetings, it was brought up that they thought, the congregation thought that they needed to buy a chandelier and put it into the, in the church. And it would be real pretty. And that old gentleman, he stood up and he said, let me tell you something. Let me tell you why we don't need a chandelier in this church. First of all, we just simply don't need it. Second of all, I can't play it, so we don't need it. The last one I give you is thoughtlessness about the great things God has done. Just simply going through the day, drifting along, not concerned or caring about where one is going, and in that state of mind, one finds themselves not thinking about the good things that God has done. They never think about the pit of sin and its bondage that they have been lifted out of and set free from. That's sad, isn't it? Never to think about how we have been lifted out of sin and its mire and, have, and we have had our feet set on a solid rock and are going established for the Lord. The cost for that occurring in our lives for some people as they drift along and drift away from God they forget about what Christ paid the great price that he paid to bring about their redemption it's a sad situation isn't it I don't ever want to forget what Christ did for me at the cross many people drift along in their life away from God and they dismiss the privileges of a believer in the body of Christ. They don't ever think about being a child of God. It just doesn't cross their mind with all the privileges that come along with being a child of God. Boy, I'm grateful for the privileges that I have of being a child of God, aren't you? Isn't it wonderful? The blessings that come our way. In the lives of so many people, they are overlooked. How sad that people never think about the blessings of the Lord and never pause to give him thanks for all that he is doing. These things are all under the umbrella of those things that are evil, and they are things that we should eschew. We should... Avoid them. We should shun them. We should not want them to be a part of our lives. Real quickly, let me give you the third one. We must avoid grieving the Holy Spirit. Paul talked about that in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And right about the end of that chapter, he said, verse 30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You see, the Holy Spirit should be very precious to each and every one of us. And we should strive with all of our being to make sure that we never, we never grieve him. We should strive to avoid grieving the Holy Spirit. He's been given to us to be our comforter and our guide. 
He is a personality, beloved, and therefore he can be grieved. Indeed, he can be grieved. Paul understood that he could be grieved. And there's many ways that he can be grieved. He can be grieved when we do not talk as we should talk and as the Lord wishes for us to talk which is why Paul said in verse 29 of this passage, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That is why he followed up by saying in verse 31, let all evil speaking be put away from you. Those things grieve the Holy Spirit and we need to strive to avoid grieving the Holy Spirit. He is grieved when his presence is ignored. He is grieved when his teaching is rejected. He is grieved when we who call ourselves believers in the body of Christ try to secretly do things that he hates and tries to lead us away from. He is grieved when we cause strife and friction among God's people. And he is grieved when we seek to serve our Savior through our own strength without relying upon him to guide and direct us each and every day. While much of this comes from the New Testament, we can go back to our text verse and think again about what Solomon was saying to his sons. Enter not into the path of the wicked. Don't go down that wrong road and don't drift away. Go not in the way of evil men. I've talked about evil. Don't go in that way. Avoid it. Pass by it. Turn from it and pass away. Go in a different route altogether. God help us to avoid complacency to also avoid any kind of deception as a part of our life. And may God help us to avoid any tendency to drift from being close to the side of the Lord and abiding in the sunshine of his love each and every day. Father, thank you for this lesson and how it speaks to my heart, and I trust it will speak to these wonderful, precious people that are here with us this evening. We'll give you praise for how you use it for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.